Well, hi everyone. I'm Wardy, and welcome to this um, web class. And I want to say hello to my guest, Paul. Hi, Paul. Who's on the line? Hi, Wardy. Hello. So, Paul LeBeau. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Pretty good. Well, that's the good American pronunciation. <laughs> What's the real pronunciation? Paul LeBeau. LeBeau. <laughs> Okay, I'll have to practice that. Well, um, Paul is with Wolfgang Mock, um, and what we're going to be talking about is a, a home stone mill later on in the web class. But Paul's love is for um, real food, and um, part of that, like me and my family, is a love for using food that's as healthy and fresh as possible. And so one of those things that we do in our homes is we grind our, our flour fresh for our baking. And so the topic of today's web class really is we're gonna be talking about baking with fresh ground flour and go over the health reasons and tips for doing it and all kinds of stuff like that, as well as talking about milling processes and um, the, the favorite kind of mill we're gonna talk about at the end. So I'm gonna stop um, talking so much and really give the floor over to Paul. Starting with Paul, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your love for fresh ground flour. Okay, well, gee, I, uh, I first came across fresh ground flour when I, when I met my wife, Sigrid. Um, she had a, uh, this, uh, this funny mill in her kitchen. And uh, I, of course, asked, well, what's that for? And, and, uh, and I realized that, um, that she didn't buy any flour. She uh, needed some. She milled it up. And she milled a lot of curious things like millet and, mm. uh, and things like spelt. And uh, I, um, I got kind of interested in it uh, for a while. And, um, uh, well, it's a bit of a long story, but in the environment in which she lived, um, there was a lot going on on the topic, and I uh, slowly and surely got, got captivated by it. Wonderful. So, Paul, could you tip your, uh, your video just came on. Could oh, you goodness. Could the screen down, then we can see sure. you better with your great hat there. Yeah, my great hat. Well, it's either my hat or my bald pate that you have to look at. I'm, <laughs> I'll try not to have to read anything, so I'll take my glasses off. Oh no, that was fine. So a little bit cut out there when it when your video came on. We lost sound for a few seconds. Could you um, go back a bit for how you got involved with the mock mill? Sure. Well, <clears throat> uh, uh, Ziggy at the time was a uh, uh, was a tenant of the mocks, and she lived in the uh, in the former pigsty of the farm that uh, Wolfgang and Frieda had bought um, back in uh, in the early eighties. And uh, uh, of course, I was a guy in a gray suit and white shirt, and red tie and black shoes and sort of suspicious to those, um, those more organic types. <laughs> um, but when they realized that Siggy and I were going to become a, a permanent thing, then they sort of got a little more accepting and we became good friends. Um, later on, Wolfgang, observing what I was doing on the business side of my life, asked me for advice in, in his business. And so we we had a business dialogue going and, and two years ago he said, come on, um, I need you to help me get this thing going. Um, and, uh, and I decided to join him. I thought um, at this stage of life, this is something I can do for the next 20 years. And I, uh, I have to work for the next 20 years because uh, I've started a new family. So I said, this is something that I could really be passionate about for the next 20 years. And that's uh, what put me on this trail. Awesome. I love that. I love when passion and life, intersect or i should say passion and business intersect so it becomes your life and you can just be put yourself a hundred percent behind the work that you do because you love it so much mm, absolutely yeah that's how i feel about our work at traditional cooking school it's a definitely a labor of love and um all the things that we share with those of you that are watching are things that are happening in our kitchen and changing my family's life for the better and i just love sharing it with all of you so okay paul we're going to talk about we're get, well let me tell everybody the hat that paul's wearing says mock mill um, because paul represents the company that produces a home stone grain mill called the mock mill and it's the mill that we're using in our family we're going to talk about it more at the end right now we're going to focus on fresh ground flour its benefits and how to use it in our home so first um, paul if you could just talk about what flour means today to most people and how that is very different from the kind of flour that um, you and I like fresh ground. Talk about the benefits and how wonderful it is. Hmm. Okie doke. Well, flour, at least to a very, very, very high percentage of what's consumed in in uh, uh, really around the world now, not just the developed world, 
um, is a is is one portion of, of what's a really complex thing, and it's the least complex portion of that. And so, um, a, uh, a a kernel of cereal grain is a really complex uh, 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 um, construction of nature. And the modern flour that we have today is all the complexity stripped away from it, all the biology stripped away from it, and some very very simple uh, phyto uh, you know products of of, of, of starch and protein. And some cellulose to kind of form the the, the, uh, the the shells of the cell. That's all it is. It's a very 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 simple thing, um, and it's made that way because uh, it, it becomes basically inert. It, it's just not going to change. Nature won't be able to change it. Um, it's very very stable. And when it was originally produced 130 years ago. Um, that was a great thing because, uh, wow, we can put it in sacks in the back of the wagon train and take it across the prairie for weeks and months and it'll stay stable, it won't go bad, and we'll have something to eat every day. Um, today, um, it has the advantage of, of being able to travel really great distances and, and hang around in warehouses forever uh, before it gets consumed. Um, and so that's the way, in general, people consume. And mm -hmm. it's different from the kind of flowers that you and I like to work with because what we do is we take that whole grain in all its complexity. And now we're talking about tens of thousands um, of, of discrete phytochemicals that, are, that, that make this up. And we're talking about some really intricate biology in the sense of an embryo that's in there that will be viable for, right. for, for decades or even centuries. And we, we grind all that up um, and eat every bit of what's in it. We, we, uh, we, we take it all, just the way that nature put it together, uh, only ground up so that we can digest it and make it into foods for ourselves. And, and there's, there's a world of difference between those two products, in, in my view. Sure, sure. So basically you're saying that um, the refinement process really whittled it down to something very simple so that it could travel and sit on a shelf. That's right, and that happens to be the big mass. Let's let's not let's forget that. I mean, that's what what we get is white flour. When you go buy all-purpose flour, is what you get is plant food, because that's the part of the grain that's the food package that nature puts there for the embryo to consume uh, mm -hmm. when it starts to sprout. It's a food package. So we get the white stuff is plant food. Um, the whole grain f f flour that you and I have coming out of our mills at home is um, is that embryo? It's all its protective uh, oils, which includes great things like tons of vitamin E and, and mm -hmm. other things that will protect it in its little oily sac that it's in. And it's a tiny little thing, by the way. Um, and then it's the the packaging that it has, what we call the brand. But that brand is this intricate, fibrous interweaving of of, of tens of thousands of protective uh, phytochemicals that that keep that embryo viable over all those years and decades and centuries. And so it's the, oh, it's very complex, that very low weight part of it. And the heavy weight plant food part, that's what we call white flour. It's gotcha. just, it's plant food. Um, and uh, uh, and what, what, what we're able to do when we mill it ourselves is to include all those protective uh, phytochemicals and all the, above all, all that, well not above all, but all that good fiber, let's not forget it, uh, that's that's included in that, plus the vitamin-rich um, uh, um, oily components um, that that surround the, the embryo, mm -hmm. or what it's, we call the wheat germ or the grain, the germ. Yeah. And in our family, we notice a huge difference in how our baked goods taste if we're using fresh milk flour versus flour, you know, store-bought flour. Could you speak to um, the major nutrition differences that really have an impact on our bodies? When we're using fresh ground versus store-bought or that refined flour. Well, well, yeah. I mean, what you have in the in the refined flour is you have uh, you have a, a good bit of protein. It's uh, depending on what grade you get. It's going to be 13, 40 percent plant protein. You know, which you otherwise, if you didn't want to get it from animal foods, you get it from from beans and from uh, uh, you know from from soy and so forth. Uh, so you get some protein, uh, and then you get a bunch of starch. And of course, the starch um, gets broken down in a in a baking process into sugars. So basically, that's got something that's going to become sugar, and and you've got uh, you've got proteins in the white part. 
when when we take the whole grain though i'll go back uh, nutritionally we have um we have some very very valuable oils in in the uh in the wheat germ in very very small quantities but they're highly they're highly valuable it's good building blocks uh for us we're still getting all that protein that's in there we still have the starch that's going to make things taste good um and then but i, I want to come back to that brand which when I listen to really highly learned people, and I'm not one of those, but I, I try to listen to them and, and take the knowledge that can be immediately useful to me from them. And they say, Paul, we have no idea how many discrete phytochemicals mm -hmm. are in the brand. We'll probably never know. And if you say hundreds of thousands, you could get accused of exaggeration, but you're probably not exaggerating. But there are at least tens of thousands. We'll never know what they all are and ex or exactly what their roles are, but we know that collectively, they're tremendously valuable for us nutritionally. They help keep our body chemistry in balance. They help make sure um, that the communications go on. And then there's all that fiber that not so much that our body needs. It needs it to assure good transport so that we have you know kind of regular toilet habits that helps. But um, what it does is to feed the bacteria that are in our gut that we want to have flourish. It's, mm -hmm. You have to think of that fiber as being fertilizer for the good, for the, for the, for the good bacteria um, in your gut. Whereas things like refined sugar are fertilizer for the weed bacteria in your gut that you don't want so much of. Mm -hmm. so, so basically nutritionally, if I capture what I, what I believe to have learned from some of the world's top uh, experts, that whole grain flour that we're eating is really incredible food that we could feed ourselves almost exclusively from. We'd have to add some things that have vitamin C and a few other things that are missing from there. But basically, we can live from whole grain flour. We cannot live from white flour alone. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we'll, we'll get sick, we'll get infertile, and we'll die if we tried to feed ourselves from only that. And that's been proven in, 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 in rodent uh, tests and uh, tests with rats that's what happens yeah so but, but we can basically re live and thrive from whole grains and and that's how civilization was built so what would you say to the person that says well what if i buy whole wheat flour off the shelf how is that different from grinding it myself at home well it depends on whose shelf they buy it from yeah. so this applies to the supermarket shelf okay what i'm going to say um but all you have to do is turn the bag over and find expiration date and if you're buying it from a well-run supermarket chain, it's gonna be, oh, 10 months, 12 months, maybe even 14 months out there. That means it been, hasn't been around for long, which is a good thing. Um, but wait a minute, that whole grain flour that you and I mix up has got all those oily components. And we all know that what happens to oil when it's exposed to oxygen the way we do when we mill our flour up, it starts to degrade. Oxygenation takes place and the oils go rancid. And they do that fairly quickly. Let's not worry about just how quickly. Let's just accept that they do it pretty quickly. They do it a lot more qu quickly than those um, eight or 10 months of shelf life that your whole grain, your whole wheat flour in the, in the supermarket has on the bag. So it's very simple. They've had to do something to that flour. Take something out or chemically or... Um, mechanically, and by that I usually mean heat, alter something in there to keep it from going bad. And that's what you have to know. So nutritionally, you've got something that's not 100% complete the way that food is that comes through your mill and into your bowl. Right. So basically, the bottom line here is we want it to be as freshly ground as possible. We also want it to be as whole as possible. And the more we move toward that, the better a flower we have. That's right. I mean, you can kind of capsulate that if you think of the fact that the wholeness is what really gives you, gives you the big nutritional benefits and the freshness is what gives you the, the olfactory and the gust of it, the, the, the taste benefits. Mm -hmm. Because that, uh, that freshness is a, big, is a big thing. Somebody sent us um, at our request a sample of the flower they had milled and a sample of the grains that they'd milled. Uh, would we please mill them and make a comparison? Are they getting good flour? And we like to do that for people. 
people. So um, that bag had been traveling, I think, for about three weeks, maybe four. Um, and so we had that done and we did the test and I had the data and I was finished with that and I was starting a bake and I said, you know what? I hate to throw foods away. I'm going to bake this stuff. You know, it wasn't very much. And I put my nose in the baggie of the flour that had just been ground, same grains. Oh, it smelled really good, nice and nutty and just a really thing. And then I took the, 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 um, the bag of, of, of uh, stuff that was three or four weeks, um, had been flour for three or four weeks. And quite honestly, it smelled like nothing, like really nothing at all. Mm. And so I think this is the, the kind of experiment you can simply do. And most of us know that freshly ground coffee is going to uh, have a much uh, uh, more pungent, uh, rich odor than will pre-ground coffee, uh, even if that pre-ground coffee has been vacuum packed. So uh, it's, it's, it's analog to that. What, what, what's going on over time is a quick breakdown of the aromatics. The aromatics that the brain is releasing, that's why it smells good, because it's letting them go, and they're coming up to our nostrils. Well, that continues for a couple of weeks, and there's nothing left more to come up to the nostrils. Mm -hmm. Well, you've convinced me. <laughs> I think you've convinced so many others. I wanna take a moment and say hi to everyone who's with us on Facebook. Um, Christina Bard is saying, I find you highly learned, Paul. Great conversation. And um, we have lots of people who are on the fence about grinding their flour or looking at the mock mill, people saying hi. Uh, Catherine says, I absolutely love my homegrown grains and the option of milling my own flowers. Good for you, Catherine. And hi to Brenda and Megan and Deborah, Jade, all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. I am going to um, take questions at the very end. So if you want to put them in, um, as several of you have, just do that and we'll scroll through at the end and have uh, Paul, take your questions. But first, I have a few questions of my own. So, Paul, I want to ask um, about your wife, because when you met, she had the mill there, and that was your first introduction to milling. So what was, what was the backstory behind your wife with her milling? Is that the way she grew up? That's how her parents did it, so that's what she did? Or did she have a transformation? Yeah, well, we, we live in a, uh, in a, in a rural community um, close to a little, um, what was a medieval center here in, in Germany, just just under the flight path into the Frankfurt airport, really, just about uh, 30 miles away from there. And that's where she grew up. Um, and and she, the, the culture of this area um, is one of a fairly high consciousness of, of, of what's healthy. And um, I'm, Gonna got a limb by saying that when she grew up, it was the uh, it was the eighties, her teenage years, and um, the natural foods movement was what every young person um, uh, found cool, quite honestly, and uh, and so it was just uh, when the first uh, natural foods markets opened up, and and you had your first apartment, that's where you went and and, and shopped for the for the food that you needed. Um, and so I guess it was just a natural step. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, uh, I believe that her, her, uh, her sister, who's now our next door neighbor, met Wolfgang Mock. And uh, almost everybody who met Wolfgang Mock, he was a bit like me at the time, the real, the real uh, missionary. Uh, they couldn't help but, but, but figure out a way to afford one of his, uh, his nice but really expensive um, wooden cased mills. And... Um, and he always found a way to get them into the hands of the people who were his friends. So if you were a friend of Wolfgang's at the time, you almost always had one of his mills. So uh, that's <laughs> I think, awesome. that, I, I think <laughs> that, that is really the story. You almost, couldn't, you, you almost couldn't live there on the farm with them without having a mill. Everybody's got a mill. <laughs> in fact, um, so I like to describe the farm to people like saying, well, well if you go in and there are nine families living there, and if you go and do the inventory of all the apartments, you'll find more uh, pianos, then you'll find television sets. Um, and then Wolfgang always pipes up and says, and lots of mills. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I shared on my podcast a couple weeks ago, but I've spoken to my, I love to talk to my dad about this because he grew up in a small village in Israel. And when he was growing up, they baked their own pocket bread. Mm -hmm. daily or I can't remember every day or, you know, so, but all the women in the village there was a village stone mill and they would take their 
grain there and mill what they needed for their baking, take care of, you know, and then that, that would just repeat as often as they needed to bake their pocket bread. And I think it sounds just wonderful. I think it sounds so wonderful. Well, you reminds me of a little story. One of my good Facebook friends and I was lucky enough to get to visit her and her husband are great homesteaders. Uh, this is uh, Polly Goldman, who's a, uh, an agricultural scientist in, uh, for the, working for the USDA down in uh, Salinas, California. And her husband um, basically founded the, the largest um, uh, university farm, uh, by, uh, what do you call it, organic uh, teaching farm in, in the United States there at University of Santa Cruz. Um, and they've got this, I drove up to their place and I said, well, I know paradise when I get there, <laughs> because it's a beautiful little perfectly um, done um, homestead. So they're big homesteaders and, and uh, she, she was interested the mock mill and, and we got her a mock mill and she at last uh, I guess it was Passover she said you know we're supposed to do our uh, do our um, matzos in under 18 minutes starting with just the flour and I said and I've done it starting with just the grains <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> so, um, you know it's, it's it's a lot of fun uh, for me on this adventure meeting this kind of fantastically interesting person and these people are living close to nature and they're conscious of they're conscious of, of, of food but what's more is they're conscious of the earth and and part of the whole milling story uh, Wardy I'm convinced of it is um, making a, a contribution to the preservation of the earth because those that 98% of the grain that gets made into white flour is not farmed organically. Uh, it's farmed in on huge swaths of earth. It's the same thing year in, year out. Um, it's not a situation where the, where the seeds use that food pack to dig into the earth and find all of the different um, minerals that the plant needs to survive and thrive, um, it's, a, it's a couch potato situation where those plants get the water they need, they get, they get three, main, uh, 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 three main elements. They get nitrogen, they get potassium, they get phosphorus, and that's all they get. And of course, they're looking for other things, so in time, they've drained the earth of all those other things, and all the earth has left in it is too much nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And, and so we're really, um, when we buy white flour, we're voting for that system. We're voting for keeping that system. Come on, let's just keep doing this until the earth's got nothing left in it. Um, when we go out and buy um, biologically, organically grown grains, um, and that's what we, we, you know, we certainly, we actually don't want to be milling up the other ones because we don't know what kind of pesticides and stuff they've got in. So we're going to get organic grains. There we're supporting the people who, like Polly and her husband, are focused on saying, how can we, every planting, put back into the earth something that the last thing we planted took out of it? And it's a very, very simple concept that, um, that uh, Chef Dan Barber made very clear to me in his book and then in his different speeches. We have to learn to eat that way. We have to eat the things that are those different plantings. So we've got to not eat the same wheat, not eat the same uh, soybeans, not eat the same corn, not eat all the same uh, meat products, meal in and meal out, but we have to get out and eat a big variety of different foods to replenish uh, uh, the things that every planting takes out of the earth. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. is my adventure, my learning uh, at this late stage in life uh, of going, wow, I was missing all this stuff uh, for, for all those uh, decades. It's never too late, though. I mean, every day is new. So we, like you were saying, we vote with our dollars. So whether we have five or 40 acres to grow the stuff ourselves, or raise our, raise our own, you know, pastured animals, or whether we take our dollars and we support someone who is doing it, like you said, we're either contributing to it or you know, voting the other direction. So we want to contribute to the people that are trying to make the soil better every year rather than depleted year to year. And it is possible with that kind of um, pasture management where you have um, animals and plants and you do that whole organic ecosystem, it is better actually for it to, I mean, it is possible for it to be better year to year, to get better year to year rather than depleted. So I totally agree. Okay. Um, Tia is saying in the comments that she likes grinding her own flour for taste and also because she doesn't have a lot of freezer space to store flowers. 
and she likes to be able to make flowers with various grains and sprouted grains. I love that, Tia. Thank you. That's um, a, an excellent point because, you know, we just talked about variety and there's so many different flowers you could go off on that, but, but just stick with the point for a second. You can't, you can't afford to keep 15 different flowers. You don't have freezer space and they get, you know, you, you forget what you've got and all that kind of stuff, but you can very easily keep a granary with 15 different sure. kinds of grains. Sure. Yeah. I mean, grains, if you store them well, you, they keep for a long time. Flour just starts degrading like we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. or you need freezer space and then it still doesn't taste as good it tastes like it's been in the freezer <laughs> most of the millers i know keep discovering new stuff kind of every couple of months ago oh, what haven't we milled so far and then they find something new and get you know they go off on that cool. for a while right cool okay well let's transition now to talking about baking with flesh fresh flour obviously we've covered the nutrition and the flavor um talk about the texture of baked goods made with fresh ground flour Ooh. Um, okay. Um, f for me personally, and I'm not really a student of this, so um, I would say... Um, Anyone I who eats it is a student. Okay, well, there you go. For me, um, what, what, what I bake with whole grain flours has a more open texture. It has a... Um, um, oh, I think it, 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 it kind of comes apart uh, uh, more easily. It kind of blossoms in... in in my mouth as I chew it, um, uh, its sweetness comes out uh, in, in, in a faster way. It's got a more, uh, it's got a more open, open kind of, uh, kind of crumb to it if we're talking about bread. Um, and um, it, yeah, I, I don't know, it just, uh, it, 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 um, uh, it goes together better with the other things I'm, I may be eating with. It, mm -hmm. to my I way. completely agree. I think that they're lighter, fresher, sweeter. They are just superior in all the important ways when you use fresh ground flour. Yeah. Well, when it comes to taste, I think that's where all of a sudden the big difference kicks in because that mm -hmm. sweetness you mentioned um, is is to me a, a, a lot bigger. And and then there's a thing that's interesting what I call complexity that's there, and that comes from not only all those different chemicals uh, being there, but if you're if you're um, fermenting your your baked goods naturally so you're you're not just taking the one yeast that louis pasteur found somebody told me the other day that it was the collected from the um from the uh rear end of ants but i haven't verified that but anyway um if you if you're not taking that one yeast you, you're baking with a, a plethora of yeast you may have a couple of dozen different kinds of yeasts and bacteria and each of them is choosing the part of the grain that it likes best and doing its job on it and its volatile products are what you're tasting. And so the complexity is that multiplicity of different um, components, the grain multiplied by all the different kinds of microorganisms that are worked there. And you get, you get this huge symphony of, of flavors, um, uh, just as you get it when you've got a bunch of different instruments playing the same music. So mm, um, great that's, analogy. that's to me the, um, the, big, the big taste difference. It may be that it's a more grown-up taste, you know. Mm -hmm. um, people are used to, if people think that marshmallows taste good, then they, they may not like, a, a, you know, my 70% my whole grain rye bread, or they, they may think it's, it's too earthy or, or whatever. Right. But that's precisely what I'm looking for, and I, I believe that my taste buds are telling me that it's good for me. Sure. And I do think we have to be patient or people need to expect that there will be a transition period. Like you mentioned, there's that complexity of flavor and white flour, white sugar is very uh, simple, just strong. Not strong. They're just simple uh, in the terms of complexity, taste, salt, sugar, white flour. You just have like one dimensional taste. Mm -hmm. Then you start using whole grains and, or, and throw sourdough into the mix. And yeah, people, people that are accustomed to the other may have initial like, ooh, I don't like this. It's the same thing from going from conventional meat to pastured meat. And the pastured meat has this wilder, complex sort of aged flavor, which can come from because it's hung in the locker for 21 days, mm -hmm. instead of just you know a few. It can come from the diverse diet that that animal has enjoyed on pasture rather than just you know genetically modified corn soy. So yeah, we are going after that complexity of flavor 
And for some people that may take some adjustment, but I believe that once we kind of wean off of that, just simple one dimensional flavors that we're used to, that we begin to appreciate and even then crave and like really enjoy um, what, what we're talking about with sourdough and with uh, whole grains. So I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, if, if we can hang on that for a second, though, I'd like mm -hmm. to contribute something that may be interesting for some people. When, when you think about it, what, nature gave us our taste buds. Why? And what are they for? Well, na our taste buds, what? We can detect sweet. We can detect salty. We can uh, detect uh, umami, which is you know, what we taste when we eat meat. We can detect uh, bitter, and we can detect sour, right? Mm -hmm. And so what are those? Well, it's a reward and a warning system. So the, 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 the pleasure we get when we taste something sweet, that's a reward for having found energy. <laughs> think about us wandering around looking for food, right? The salt, the salty taste that we like is a taste, is it a reward for us finding the electrolyte? So we need to keep our blood working. I mean, without the salt, then our systems won't work. The, elect the, the electrical impulses can't be carried through our body without salt. So we need the salt. So we get that reward for that. We need protein. And that's the, re that's the reward we get when we, when we get that nice umami taste is for having found protein. And we have the two warnings, sour and bitter, are warning for us. A little bit of bitter may be nice, but everything that's poison tastes bitter. And so when we get a really strong bitter test that says, oh boy, don't eat that. And the same thing is true of sour. Sour is a warning that things are going bad. So we, we like the light sour taste to our uh, sourdough, for instance, or to our, to our fermented foods. But if they go too far, we won't want to eat them. And it's our, our system warning us. Well, the food industry of the last 150 years has spent all of its time and energy developing stuff to fool our taste buds hmm. into thinking that the stuff they give us is good for us. And so we get this combination of all those rewards, which is, which is lots of sugar, lots of fat, um, and lots of salt all, kind of all combined together. And the interesting thing is that our taste buds being thrown off guard, they quit telling us when we've had enough of something. But if we, if we train our, if we let our taste buds get retrained by eating only natural foods, only real foods that our great grandparents would recognize as food, Michael Pollan's contribution to my understanding, um, then our taste buds start to tell us, um, this is really great bread. Uh, hey, but Paul, you've already had three slices. You know? And so I don't do the potato chip bag deal with my loaf of, of uh, whole grain bread because I'm getting the feedback from my system um, that's cool. And uh, I personally have been able, since I started baking my own whole grain bread, to, to, to lose about 30 pounds. Awesome. Wonderful. Wonderful. We are getting a question from Denise. Did you say there are different kinds of yeast? What kind of yeast should one use? If I was to answer that, I would say uh, wild yeast, a sourdough starter. And there's just a micro, it's just an ecosystem of so many you can't count bacteria and yeast. What would you answer to that? Paul? I'd say whatever presents itself. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a, I've, I've, uh, one of the great uh, people I've met since I've been here is my baker friend, Pablo Gayet, and he, he introduced me to um, yeast water, which is the, that you make a, uh, uh, you make a uh, sugar, uh, you make some sugar water and you drop anything that's vegetal that you would also eat into it. And anything that's vegetal, that you would eat is going to be covered with yeasts and and uh, lactobacillus. Um, they're basically good for you, and they're kind of hanging around on that plant, waiting for the plant to generate to the point that they can get to the sugars in the plant. So they're on the outside of your apple. And why does your apple start to go bad if you make a little cut in it? Well, those bugs can get to it, and they <laughs> sugar time. They've been waiting for that. What if you drop? that fruit into the sugar water, those plant, those bugs that are there, I call them bugs, but I mean yeast and, 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 and bacilli, they start giving each other the elbow, hey, wake up, it's party time. And, and, and they, they consume that sugar pretty rapidly. And in so doing, they're multiplying their numbers and they give you a really great, um, a really great culture with which, for instance, to, to, um, to uh, hydrate your bread. And that becomes that replaces the yeast that you would normally put in bread. That and, is so cool. Yeah, and you can do this. And of course, traditional sourdough says, we're just gonna get some flour wet and whatever 
yeasts and microbacteria were on the grain because they're on the yeah. grain. I said, you know, they're on it. And whatever is in the kitchen and whatever is on my hands when I mix it up, that's what's going to grow. And there's going to be a little bit of a battle between them to see who gets to grow more. And, and those that are more dominant will be there in greater numbers. But, but it's, we just call it wild, wild yeast. But what we mean is it's a, it's a, it's a natural, naturally occurring culture that has something to do with the environment which you are. And that's the yeast that, that uh, that's what I use. I've, I've actually, in my baking, I've, I've actually never used commercial yeast. And of course I haven't been baking for long, so that's not a big statement, but, but uh, I've had these people teaching me these other ways to do things and that's just what I do. I love that. Denise, if you are wondering for instructions on how to make a sourdough starter, you can go to tradcookschool.com slash starter. And I have a video and instructions right there for you. That is the flour and water kind. Um, I love the, I love the, the, the tip that you learned from your friend with the sugar water. Of course, the sourdough starter that's flour and water, the flour has the sugar and it has the, the wild organisms. So you combine it with water and they, they can take off and within a few weeks they've reestablished. Yeah, yep, exactly. But anyway, there's all kinds of ways to, to um, ferment your, uh, your grain products naturally. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that just is, I think I mentioned earlier, that gives you Actually, not only does it give you a bigger flavor experience, but the important thing is that that fermentation is slow. If you use commercial yeast, it works really quickly. That's why Pasteur was sure he had made a big contribution to the world with it. Um, but the problem with that is that the, 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 the sugar molecules in the grain don't get broken down as well as they can. And in a natural fermentation, they get broken down so that they're more easily digestible for us. And that's another mm -hmm. story. It's a bit long but it's an important one to keep in mind. Naturally fermented, long, long fermented um, grain products are going to be more easily digested um, and uh, they're gonna make life more comfortable and um, probably help out the communications of those bug bacteria to their brain and all kinds of other, in other ways, keep your system uh, running uh, more, more smoothly. Absolutely, you're speaking our language. That is one of the biggest things that we teach at traditional cooking school is the health benefits of using traditional methods like sourdough, because sourdough, the wild yeast and bacteria, just like old fashioned fermented pickles and sauerkraut, that process makes the food more nutritious and digestible. So it's really good. So if you combine whole grain, fresh ground with those age old methods, you just have the best food possible. Yeah. Okay, so let's do some tips here. Um, tips for using fresh ground flour instead of store-bought in your baking. And um, so I'll let you go first, Paul, and I'll add some if, if I can, unless you cover it all. Well, uh, it can't all be covered by anybody, but I, uh, I have some things I love to do. And one is to, is to, um, is to use grains spontaneously. Um, so I've got a, um, in my refrigerator, I've got a, a pot of, of sourdough that's my, I call my pancake pot. And um, I just keep it going. And every time I add 100 grams of, of, uh, of uh, grain to it, I add an egg and about 50 grams of milk and about a gram and a half of salt and, uh, and a little bit of baking soda. It's a, um, the baking soda is a trick I learned from, uh, from Judy Coyle. And uh, so I just keep that going, the baking soda, um, tends to take the sourness off of it. So my kids like the not so sour um, uh, pancakes better. Um, but I just keep adding different stuff. So the, like this week I, 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 I got some te teff out and toasted the teff up and then milled that. And if you've ever, if you've never milled, if you've never tried toasted teff, that's my tip for that. Two words, toasted teff. <laughs> Toast your teff and mill that up and you'll have a, 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 a aroma sensation. This is incredible. Um, but I even tried toasted sorghum and that had the same effect of really giving the flour a much richer, uh, much richer, more flavorful um, aroma. Are you, can I just ask, are you toasting in a dry skillet or do you put yeah. it on? A, okay, yeah. great. Yeah. I've also, I, when I, I like to dust my, uh, dust my flour with, um, with uh, toasted barley in, in the kitchen. In our bakery doesn't have a, uh, hot plate, so I just put it on the pan in the oven. I have to be careful because if I'm not, if I'm not, I'll burn it up. Okay. Um, but uh, but um, that works too. So it mm -hmm. really doesn't matter. The most important thing is to keep it moving a little bit and don't overdo it. But the grains start to pop like popcorn, and then you know you're pretty much there. 
Um, so that's that's what I would say is, is mill spontaneously. And then just look around and see what's there and say, well, what if I put some of this in? Let's put some oats in. Let's, uh, let's add some uh, rye or here. I, haven't, I, I don't really know much about millet. Let me buy some millet and see what happens when I use millet in some of my, um, some of my cooking. And without making it a, a huge event, like I'm going to make millet bread and then you work all day to make your millet bread and then you don't like it and then you're all sad about it. No, no, no. Find a way to use it where it's kind of a low risk situation and, and you get to learn all these different um, uh, about all these different foods that, that we neglect uh, from disuse. Great. I love it. So back to your pancake pot. So you're adding those ingredients. It's in the mm -hmm. fridge, so it's mm -hmm. just souring, it's ready to go. So that is literally your pancake batter. That you yeah, and it's amazing to me how much it ferments in the fridge. Yeah. That's just, a, to me, it's incredible. But that's right. I stir it up a little bit, it goes down, it comes back up. Um, I don't mind. And I just, uh, when I think I've, you know, I've, I've uh, done around the pancakes, and so I add 100 grams or 200 grams of flour back in, and as I mentioned, the other ingredients, it just keeps going, and it's different every time. That's so cool. Everyone listening, that was a gem right there. So whoever heard that, <laughs> you got the good stuff right there. <laughs> Love it. Well, um, I'll add a couple tips. Um, this comes up a lot. People are using store-bought flour. They start grinding it from scratch. But then what do you do about all those recipes? Because most recipes today are written for store-bought flour and it settles over time. Um, now, if you are following a recipe that is called for sifting, um, that's different because that'll lighten it back up. But the idea is that your fresh ground flour is very light and lofty. It has not settled because it has just been ground. So you want to use less, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you want to use, okay, I'm getting mixed up in my head. Um, it's fluffier, so it's actually less flour than a recipe that's written for store-bought flour that's settled, so you need to use a little bit more fresh ground flour than um, store-bought flour. Right, Paul? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll put on my stuffy European hat and, and uh, drop the M-bomb that's called metric, and I'll say, learn <laughs> to learn to measure with weight yes. by weight. Yeah. Forget yeah. those cups, right. forget those spoons, get yourself a good digital scale. They cost you know twenty dollars at, at uh, your local store if they're and if you want to go to one that's actually denominated in tenths of a gram you're going to spend a good bit more money but you'll be really happy sure. and and start to weigh that what you're measuring out is very very easy to convert yourself is figure out okay you know how much does uh, a cup of this that I've been using weigh and then you'll find out it's a lot easier to cook that way sure. and so um, in, in that sense. Um, you get around the problem, but you're right. Uh, I think I read that somewhere just yesterday uh, that a cup of all-purpose flour weighs 140 grams. Well, actually, if you measured one and I measured one, somebody else measured one, we get 145, 140, and 135 or something. But um, I, for instance, use uh, have used for a while 100 grams per cup of uh, of um, freshly ground flour, and some people tell me that's um, that's less dense than what they get. They get more like under 20. Mm -hmm. So, it, and it really matters um, which grain you're using, how coarsely you ground it, um, maybe even what the humidity is in your environment on that particular day. Mm -hmm. And that's where cooking by weight takes all the guesswork and all the mystery out of it. Yeah, absolutely. We do include weights in all our einkorn recipes in our einkorn baking e-course for anyone who's listening because in our family we have transitioned to weighing out our recipes as well. Um, but I do know there's so many people out there who haven't. So that is a general tip just to help you understand um, transitioning. You're going to end up using more flour by volume, <clears throat> not weight, of course but more flour by volume of fresh ground than store-bought that's settled. And once you, if you start weighing, you know, document right on your recipes. So then you can, when you get it right, you can replicate it. Or if you find out it's too dense or too dry, then next time you, you weigh less and it's a learning process. Yeah, um, we, we actually, uh, we, we say to people when we're talking about weight, by the way, mm -hmm. just the same weight um, of, freshly ground flour as you would of white flour. See what happens. Yeah. And then, you know, that, that's the easiest thing. But above all, don't be fearful and don't, don't consider it a big deal. Um, 
you know, it's uh, uh, sure there'll be some differences. You'll notice that, and if it's uh, if you find your dough is too wet, you'll put in a little more flour. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, above all, no, I would say no worries. You know, my Australian friends always say no worries, and mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing. Be sure, be certain of one thing: is that you're doing yourself a favor, you're doing your family a favor, um, you're doing all those people who are out there working hard to produce these 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 um, uh, these um, identity preserved grains a favor and you're doing the earth a favor. Absolutely. That reminds me, uh, we were watching a cooking show the other night and this lady was making, I don't know, it was a sponge batter or frosting or what. And she said, I know this would be so much faster and easier if I did it in the mix in the mixer, but I got to feel what this is like. And I know it's going to take me longer. So she's holding this big, huge bowl and just whipping it. And she's like, my arms are getting tired. But she said, I have to know what this feels like because I can't make it if I don't know this. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, Paul's advice is great. Don't worry about it. And my advice, be hands on and Nothing is, I mean, everything's redeemable. If you get two dents of bread, it's croutons or a bread pudding, you know, you can, it's still good food and it's way better. So be willing to make mistakes um, and learn. Learning is often more important than what you get out of, like what you actually put in your mouth. <laughs> Not completely true, but you, you get the idea. Well, um, let's talk about the mock mill now because we're nearing an hour and I wanna make sure we get to it. I'm gonna share my screen here because I, I'm gonna show everybody a picture of the mock mill. Um, let me know everybody if you can see that. I don't know if it's gonna come up on Facebook. So here is the mock mill. Can you see that everyone on Facebook? Yeah, I think it's coming up there. Okay, so Paul, could you talk to us um, first about Wolfgang Mock, who is the maker of this mill, and just maybe just a few minutes on his background and why this mill, the Mock mill exists today and, and how we got here. Really quickly, Wolfgang uh, received on his 29th birthday a present of a loaf of bread from a friend of his, wondered what in the world is this all about, had to be polite, cut the bread open with his friend, took a bite and changed his life. Um, <laughs> He said, wow, I've never had bread before. And, um, and he learned that his friend milled his own flour. And so that very week, he started learning how to make bread milling his own flour from his friend. Um, and after a year or so, he was kind of tired of cranking this mill that didn't belong to him anyway. And he went out to try to find an electric one that would make the job easier. And he couldn't find one he liked. He found mills that kind of blew the, blew the flour around. He didn't want anything that was blowing flour around. So he said, no, no, we've got to make our own. And he... He actually, uh, together with a friend, uh, built the first mill in his kitchen. And, and long story short, his, his work as a psychologist, working with autistic kids, became less and less important to him. And uh, the idea of better and better mills, more important. And so Wolfgang, for 40 years, you can say, has been working on building a better and more affordable mill because he'd like to have everybody feel as certainly they can afford to own a high quality mill that makes flour from whole grains that any baker would be proud to bake with. Uh, so that's Wolfgang's story. And by the way, uh, on our website, maybe Wadi can make the link available. There's a nice story about that called the, maker, the Making of the Mill Maker. And I'd encourage you, if you're interested, uh, to give that a read. But anyway, um, uh, this, the mills you see there are Wolfgang's latest work over the last five years in making mills affordable because this, mill that would deliver flour like this used to cost $500 and upwards. Um, and he just felt that it was, it was too honest when people would say, I can't afford that, you know, not, not this year anyway. Um, and so the mill in the very, in the background, you see that it's mounted on the kitchen age is the aid is the little mock mill that was the, the first real high quality stone mill to, um, uh, to be available for under $200. And the idea was we can use the motor on the, on the kitchen aid and uh, people even with small apartments and so forth don't have a space problem and uh, this mill will make great flour and indeed when I took it around to places like Washington State University's bread lab or I took it to bakers like Craig Ponsford who had led the US team to win the, uh, the uh, world championship of bread making in Paris they all said can't believe this flour just this is amazing and they all took these little mills home to use at home when they were 
baking for their families or, or um, experimenting with new recipes. So that's the little mock mill for stand mixers in the back. But what, of course, we knew as we were kind of limited to, to selling that for a couple of years is that it's slow. It produces about, oh, about a, a, an ounce and a half of, um, of flour a minute. And, um, and if you want to make a good bit of flour, you're going to probably um, put too much stress on your KitchenAid. So there's some limitations to that, to that little mill. Although I still love mine and I take it with me wherever I go because I can always find a, a KitchenAid somewhere and then I've got my mill with me. Anyway, um, in the front you see the, the mock mill 100 with a little green dot and behind it, the mock mill 200 with a blue dot. They're in exactly the same casing. Um, the, um, the, the front one is really kind of, think of it as our Model T mill. That's our Henry Ford mill. That's the mill that absolutely everybody can afford and it's just, will do a great job of milling anything that you want to mill that's not basically oily or basically moist, okay? Uh, and, and so that's the mill that we all now have in our kitchens. That's what I use every day. That's what I, I baked five loaves of bread this morning uh, used and, and, and made the dough yesterday using that mill. Uh, behind is the Mach Mill 200 that's got a stronger motor in it and a more aggressive set of stones. Um, more aggressive means it grabs more grain faster and puts it through. That way, that's great for people who make a lot of bread. Um, it, it works twice as fast as the other. And that means that it's running for half the time. Uh, and let's say the con let's be honest, the conversation conversation stopping noise that goes on when you're milling is that it, uh, goes on for only uh, half the period of time. And that's, the <laughs> mock mill, that's the mock mill 200. Huh? So that's it. And these mills are designed so that everybody can say, right, um, this is a good thing, and we'll just skip something that we otherwise like to do this month, and we can afford it. And uh, that's the that, that's the deal. And as far as the 200 is concerned, anybody who's professionally involved in a food preparation a business, they've got something to mill. Almost all their dry foods for them will do wonderful spice mill and stuff. People hate in a, in a professional kitchen, hate to mill peppercorns. Hey, this chews through, and you won't believe it. And then you just drop a little handful of rice in behind it. You've got some peppery rice and the mill's clean. Yeah, it's amazingly easy to clean. I'll just interrupt and let you know how much I love the mock mill. Um, our family milled with a Vitamix, a high power blender, for 10 years. And um, then I started using an impact mill, which gave me fine flour but couldn't crack things, couldn't crack grains. It was only flour, very loud. There was dust, flour was warm. <clears throat> now, using the mock mill, I really believe that stone is the way to go. Um, you get a cool to the touch flour, a fine grind and versatility with all the grains and beans and dry spices that you can grind, as well as being able to crack grains. So I absolutely love the mock mill. Gets my highest recommendation. And there is a link there for you on the screen, but you can also type this into your browser or I'll paste it with the video when we're done. Tradcookschool.com slash mock mill. And we want to let you know about some additional um, bonuses and information that comes with your mail. So do you want to address the two guides now, Paul? Yeah, um, uh, our team is doing what I think is a really good job in, in answering a couple of essential questions. Gee, um, uh, how do I get started uh, uh, baking with fresh, um, uh, with fresh flour? Um, and here are some nice idea recipes that have been uh, donated to us from some of the absolute leaders in the uh, wholesome baking community in the, uh, in the United States. Um, so um, some, some tips on what you can bake from some really key people there. And then what's really important, where am I going to get my grains? Because yeah. you won't find them in every grocery store. By the way, you will find millable stuff in every grocery store. And every time I go to a store, I go and look for what they've got that's millable and you discover some pretty neat stuff. But, um, but, but here you can, you can use this ebook to look up some addresses. I've had the pleasure of getting to meet most of the people who are shown there. And these are all extremely hardworking people um, who are um, really focused on that story of, 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 of providing people with a better food than has been available for the last few decades and doing so in a way that preserves the earth. And, and actually tries to get back some of the stuff that's lost there. So those are all really hardworking, um, great uh, salt of the earth people 
um, from whom you can get online or, uh, or if they happen to be in your area, uh, fresh grains. Great. And if anyone's interested in seeing how this mill operates, I've been um, demonstrating it in my weekly podcast all through the month of November. So askwardy.tv, we have two episodes ready for you already, one with gluten-free and one with just the basics of grain grinding. So that'll show you how the mill operates. Super easy and it makes great flour. And additionally, for a limited time, I'm throwing in some extra bonuses for anyone who decides to purchase the mock mill. Um, they are two of our ebook and video packages, sourdough A to Z and einkorn baking. Einkorn is the oldest variety of wheat. It's a 5,000 year old variety of wheat that's gentler to digest with the gluten and the starch. And we love it, especially combining it with sourdough. So those two recipe e-cookbooks plus a whole bunch of videos um, are a bonus from me valued at $128 with your purchase of the mock mill. So basically you use tradcookschool.com slash mock mill to order your meal. Then you can claim your extra bonus for me. It is, does come from me. The things that Paul was talking about, you'll get delivered with your meal. But if you want my eBooks, you need to go to tradcookschool.com slash mill bonus, all one word to get those two. And um, yeah, check it out at askwardy.tv to see how it works. Or if you have more questions kind of about the basics of milling. The very first episode, I went through the different types of mills and why I think stone is great. And this is, um, put the picture back up. It's just a wonderful mill. Maybe we could take a couple minutes for questions, Paul? Oh, I love that. Okay, so um, my first one is from Barb, who says she ordered her mock mill last week. Yay, Barb. <laughs> and it ships out tomorrow. Can't wait to start using it. Her question is, can I use the fresh ground flour to make pasta? What do you oh. think, Paul? <laughs> You'll love that. In fact, what I've been told by other people um, uh, who, have, who are promoting fresh milling is it's really with pasta that the difference in the flavor um, that you have with fresh milling really comes out. Um, I would say to go ahead and take a, um, uh, take a look at it, you can make your pasta from any, anything, you know, any, any, any grains you like. Um, uh, when I visited um, Teresa Greenway, um, I guess about a month and a half ago, um, to, to bring her mock mill, she said, well, let's mill up what I've got here and let's make some noodles. And we had uh, wonderful homemade chicken soup and noodles that she made while she was talking to me. Um, so it works really well. And, but you've got some great things. Kamut is a great grain for, uh, for uh, noodles. The Italians buy a whole lot of that. Uh, and, but you can have a lot of fun experimenting with the different things you can do. Yep, it's great. We've okay. got a, uh, I think uh, we've actually got a, uh, uh, a recipe for, um, uh, for pasta, at least the basic one uh, for sourdough pasta uh, that, that are available to Mockno users. Great. Okay, another question is from Beverly, who's saying um, she and her husband both love bread, but they have Thi she has thyroid disease, so they're looking into gluten-free flours and wants to grind her own. So um, I would answer that and say that Beverly, <laughs> check out Ask Wardy last week. It's episode 98 where I demonstrated grinding gluten-free flours. I showed you how to run rice and quinoa and amaranth and teff just right through it and make a blend. And I talked about different kinds of blends because if you're looking into gluten-free, um, gluten-free works really well grinding it with the mock mill. And the more different grains you can put into your blend, the better your results are going to be with um, like whatever you're baking. And so gluten-free is definitely one of those things with thyroid that they say to do. So, you know, weigh that out and test if it works for you, but you definitely can make a lot of gluten-free things using this mill. And milling it yourself, because specialty grains are, specialty flours are more expensive. So if you can acquire the whole grain organically in bulk, you're going to save money on the grain and easier time storing it, then be able to custom make your blends. So you're saving money, you're getting a better and a healthier result overall. So I'm really excited for you. I think it's exciting. Would you add anything to that, Paul? You know, I think you've covered all the points. It's okay, great. great, great. So glad that you're doing that work because if anybody needs fresh milling, it's the people who want to go gluten free, and you're mm -hmm. you're covering that place, and that's just wonderful. Yeah, there are so many, so many. Um, so Deborah, that is going to be to answer your question as well because you're asking about thyroid. So 
look into the gluten free. Go ahead, Paul. I would say one point: if you do, or if you are really going gluten free, particularly if you're a celiac patient, then you know this, but everybody else should know it too. Write gluten free across that mill and don't ever put anything else in it. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. Elizabeth is asking, she says she's going to order very soon. She wants to know about the differences between the KitchenAid attachment and the 100, particularly in terms of fineness of the flour. Well, I think the 100 is going to give you a slightly finer flour. What I, what I point out is the kitchen, that the KitchenAid attachment, and it's near and dear to my heart, is, is a great tool it's especially good if somebody says, ah, I don't want another footprint in my kitchen or I don't have space. Um, and if they've already got a KitchenAid um, and if they're a, a smaller household, so they don't have six kids running around that they're, that they're baking you know, stuff for, that's a, a, a great, a great uh, tool. If you tend to use flour a cup or two cups at a time, hey, that will probably work really well for you. And the difference in fineness, you probably wouldn't notice quite honestly. Although if you ask me, I'd say the motorized mills will be, will give you slightly finer flour. Um, okay. All that being said, if you're a serious baker and, and you, you look forward and you say, I could be baking more than I am today and so forth. I'd say spend the, the marginally additional sum. You've got place on, space on your counter. And by the way, the, mar the electric models don't take up a lot of space. No. Um, and they no look, profile. I think they look nice. I'd be interested to see what other people think. But, um, but uh, uh, then I would say I'd go the extra, uh, I, I'd go the extra a uh, few dollars and, and, and buy the Mark the 100. Yeah, that's great. So for family cooking, higher volume, or if you really want the just marginally additional fineness and or the speed, um, the 100 is going to be better than the KitchenAid attachment, but the KitchenAid attachment is great for low volume, small families. Yep. Online, Paul? Yep. Okay. Space constrained people. Great. It has a few little tricks that are neat. It's a, it's the, it's the only mill on the market that we know you can adjust the speed on. So if you want to go slowly, you can, and, and, but in so doing, you can do some things you can't do with a big one. Like you can make really great confectioner sugar out of your, uh, out of your, um, organic sugar <laughs> and you can't do that on the big mill it's turning too fast and it just gives you a uh it doesn't work whereas the little mock mill uh, does a great job with it so it's uh as i said it's near and dear to my heart it's certainly a a valuable tool yeah and i could see where if there were families that were doing gluten-free and gluten milling that they might want to have a kitchen aid and then the, the um countertop and so then Bingo. they could do separate and they would also have some you know, extra benefits like you were talking about. Yep, I, I agree totally. Yep. Okay, Cindy is grinding in a Ninja and her grain stays coarse. Will the flour be lighter when milled in the mock? Well, I haven't used a Ninja, but I've used a Vitamix and a Blendtec. And I think those are probably finer than your Ninja would do. So I'm going to say absolutely, your flour will be finer with the mock mill. What would you say, Paul? Well, I, I think, Marty, you've done a lot of work on, on what kind of mill to choose, and, and you've said, well, we'd like to hear stone milling is the best. Let's remember that the stone mill is one of the oldest uh, tools known to man. I looked this up the other day. It goes back, uh, what they think, 30,000 years, man's been milling grains with stone. The, the, the kind of blade, um, blade uh, uh, pulverizer uh, is, is something pretty new. It goes at very, very high speeds and it whacks the particles, you know, continuously. The grains go through the R mill very, very quickly and they're done, you know. They don't get beat up for the period of time that you're milling, which is what happens with, with, um, with those. I just say to people, look, hey, you know, um, if you want to make flour, we've got this stone mill. Um, I can guarantee you I'm not going to use my stone mill to make smoothies. <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, I've been on the other side of that fence and I'm so glad I have the stone mill. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't see, unless I've missed it, I think, well, okay, this is a question from Dustin back to the vegetable yeast water ferment thing you were sharing. Dustin's asking, how long do you typically let that vegetable yeast water ferment? I use Pablo's method, and what, what he suggests is to, is to take whatever vessel you're using, let's say it's a mason jar, you do it about half full, let it go for, uh, um, for three full days, and on the fourth day, 
um, replenish it. But whereas we had 10% sugar water at the very beginning, then only from then on replenish with 5% sugar water. And then that means that on the eighth day, um, you, your, your, your uh, culture should be good to use. And it's really easy to test it. You just taste it. And if it doesn't taste sweet, then it's done. If it still tastes sweet, then you've given the bugs more food and they'd be able to consume and either the culture's not happy or you put too much sugar. So you just got to wait until they do your, their job. But basically it should taste, um, shouldn't taste sweet. That's so it really reminds me of a ginger bug, which is the basis for making a homemade ginger soda. Of course, in that it's a sugar water where you add ginger and you're kind of. It's exactly the same thing. That, that, that stuff would make a wonderful starter for your sourdough. And in fact, so will, you know, uh, natural apple juice that you let go mm -hmm. too far. The problem with the natural apple juice or, or uh, grape juice, which is on its way to becoming wine, if you think about it, is it's got too much sugar in it. So it's, it's contributing a bunch of sugar to the bread, which isn't a bad thing, but um, I suppose that it, um, it, the, 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 uh, the bugs are going to go keep going for the sugar molecules in the, in, in the, in the dough then, uh, instead of going uh, uh, you know, more for the grain molecules. So mm -hmm. we, we tend to make sure that whatever we're using is soured out. You know, it's the sugar, it's, it's basically got very, very sure. little residual sugar left in it. Right, all that needs to be eaten up, yep. Okay. But there's lots of, I just said, there's lots of information on the web. You just start looking at the buzzwords, yeast water, and, and, and it's a whole different thing. But the point is, this takes you into a world of adventure where you can really have lots of fun. Oh, unlimited adventure. So many things to do. Um, Sherry's asking about whisper mill versus the mock mill. Um, so Sherry, the whisper mill is an impact mill, I believe. So similar to the Nutra mill. And the differences between it and the mock mill, number one, versatility. So um, the whisper mill or Nutramill, the impact mills, they're only gonna do flour. <laughs> the mock mill will do your flour. It'll also do, or it'll do, it'll, it'll do flour and it'll crack grains. Um, another difference would be what kind of things you can do with it. So the mock mill is gonna do other things like your dry spices and non-oily things. Ad additionally to like grains, it'll do, beans and spices and things. And another difference really is the flour dust. So the great thing about an impact mill is you do get very fine flour, but because of the impact under which that flour is produced, you get a lot of fine dust in the air and around your surface, which can be an issue for people with respiratory issues. Um, those are the big differences I can think of, but basically for our family, it comes down to the versatility. So we can do a lot more with a mock mill and still get fine flour. Now, I had a, an impact mill user say to me on the phone today, that he's been happy with his, and he's, he's, uh, but he's, he's bought a mock mill now because what he hopes, he says, gee, he says that it's, uh, when I grind flour, it's a big job. So I tend to make a lot and then and try to store it. What I'm hoping is I can, I can mill just what I need for right now, just in time, that the mill will be that convenient for me. And, and I think the mock mill actually will do that for him. Mm -hmm. um, but in positive terms, it's important to remember too that uh, it takes about 15 seconds to open the mock mill up, take a look inside, see how it's doing in there, brush stuff off if you like to, um, and, uh, uh, and make sure everything's fine and dandy. Um, I do think those impact mills have to be, or, or have a closed milling chamber that you, you can't inspect. Um, and I think there's, although I wouldn't say that's a problem, I, I as a consumer would be concerned using one. Sure. But, uh, and the impact mill, before you use it, you do need to like pull out the bucket. You need to clean out the filter thing because that can get all full of flour. And so then your next run, you won't, you won't get um, the proper filtering. So it'll just build up and sort of spray all over your kitchen. That's happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so even with that, you need to spend 15, 30 seconds to like get it ready to do a batch. So, but I do, yeah. I do think the mock mill is more, more instant. I mean, it's just on their counter. It's so attractive. You turn it on and put the grain in and it spits out. I don't know. It just feels that way. So uh, let's see. I, are there any more questions? Oh, there was a question. Um, okay, Deborah, are your milled flours able to be used in a bread machine or will the dough be too heavy and need a regular oven? I 
Help, Wardy, help. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say it's no different. <laughs> you can use fresh ground, mil fresh milled flours in a bread machine, just like an oven. So in fact, you probably get better results if you're already used to a bread machine and a recipe. You know, make an adjustment for the lighter flour, but your bread will probably turn out better <laughs> because fresh milled flour just always turns out better. <laughs> What do you think, Paul? <laughs> well, I think I like that answer. I, I, I'll, I'll remember it. So I'll, next time I hear the question and I'm alone by myself, I'll say, a, a very learned person answered that question <laughs> by saying, because I, I just don't have any experience with bread machines. So yeah. I, I, I'd have to pass. I do from a long time ago before I started using sourdough and I was using baker's yeast. Mm -hmm. I would mill our own flour and I would use the bread machine to do the kneading and the rising. Mm -hmm. And then I would stop it before it baked and I would dump the dough into a regular loaf pan and bake it mm -hmm. in my oven. So I got the, you know, regular loaf pan look, but the bread machine did all the work. <laughs> yeah. But I've never figured out a modification for sourdough because the bread machines are all the, you know, baker's yeast timing, which is really mm -hmm. fast. It's not like overnight mm -hmm. souring. So uh, I don't know much about that, but I do know that, uh, Everyone who I know who bakes talks about the mystique of baking, about, you know, I always say there's a, there's a bake day and a non-bake day, and bake days are always better. Um, <laughs> and I love the feel of the dough. I love touching it, and I love folding it, and, um, you know, I love scraping off my fingers, and I love when my little boy comes running in and says, Daddy, can I have a taste? Can I have a taste? Can I have a taste? And um, so uh, I... You know, I mean, I've, I worked with the KitchenAid for the longest time milling, but I never use it for mixing, <laughs> interestingly. Yeah, well, dough. I mean, I'm with you now. I love kneading dough. I love to feel it. I got over that that desire to have the bread machine do all the work, and I've been doing my own for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is, will be the last question because we are over time. Need to let Paul go. Beverly, when grinding your own flours and making sourdough, how long do we have to wait to use the flour in our starter or when making the bread? I've been told I need to wait a week after milling. What's the truth about this? <laughs> oh, I'm glad I get to answer that one. Okay. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to a visit next week from a, the man I, I think to be the most learned on this topic. And I actually went to him a year ago and said, or I, I wrote to him and I had this list of questions like this one. And I said, I want to be able to answer these in an authoritative way. And, um, I don't know how to find the answer in the literature, so please. And uh, so he invited me to his lab at Oregon State University. This is Andrew Ross. And when I got there, he had the ovens going. He had been there, obviously, for hours. And he had 24 loaves of bread in the oven. And he said, well, I, I baked bread to answer each of your questions. <laughs> anyway, so at the end of the day, the fact was that it didn't make um, – any difference at all uh, how old the flour was. He had some that had been in the freezer for a year, some that had been uh, milled, you know, uh, um, I don't know, a couple of weeks before, and then the, the flour was freshly milled. What he explained to me is this notion of aging flour has to do with the prioritization of um, consistency, what the bakers call consistency. And a professional baker who's got a, who's, who's making hundreds of loaves of bread a day or thousands or tens of thousands, or sorry about this, hundreds of thousands a day. He wants to get the bread to be the same every time he makes it. He can't afford to have it be different. And so he wants his flour to always be the same. And the industrial mills work very hard um, at delivering a product that's gonna behave the same way because otherwise they'll get a call from the bakery saying, your flour's not working. Uh, and Andrew explained to me that that's fine and dandy, but what happens is so you age it because it, the starting point in terms of let's just call it potency of flour is very very different depending on the the, the grain itself on the on the um you know the the climate in which it was grown that year and lots of other things and also on uh, just on the, the 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 humidity in the in the room on a given day and uh, so you get a large variety, a large variance in terms of potency of different loads and lots of, of flour. But if you leave them stay for about three weeks, they oxidize. So they start to die. You get that degradation we were talking about that's going on. And as they do, they come to a common point after a number of weeks of deadness, if you like. This is, this is his words, not mine. Okay. 
and uh, and so what the aging is for is to is to is to kill the flower enough so that it's uh, so all of it's the same. Um, now he says that comes to the detriment of nutrition and it comes to the detriment of flavor. You prioritize consistency and you say, we're not too worried out of flavor difference won't be that much. And, eh, you know, um, the rest of it, who cares? Um, when you bake with fresh flour, you're putting flavor and you're putting nutrition at the top of your priorities list. And you're, accepting the fact that today's flour is going to be a little different from tomorrow's flour, even if it's the same grains, um, and your bread may be a little bit different. Um, that's the fact. Uh, but the priority you're placing on it, and I think your family, if you ask them, would say, well, really, I prefer to have bread that tastes as good as it can possibly taste and is as healthy, as good for me as it can possibly be. And I'm not too worried about whether it's a quarter of an inch higher or lower than it was last week. Right. That was Andrew's answer, uh, and um, I have to say that I'm after him to get that in a publishable form because I do think there's a lot of misunderstanding on that point. Mm -hmm. And she's also asking about starters, so if I could address that, mm -hmm. because there are people um, that talk about if you have a sourdough starter to feed it old flour because the fresh flour will have bacteria and yeast that will compete, and whether or not that's true, and maybe it is true, I don't know, but um, I have always made starters with fresh flour. I feed starters with fresh flour. If your sourdough starter is a strong culture, that competition is nothing to it. <laughs> so you do not have to let your flour be a week old after milling to feed your sourdough starter or to use it in a sourdough recipe. Would you agree with that, Paul? Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so, and often if you buy per purchased, like dried starters, they will say use old flour to feed it. Um, I have revived them with fresh ground flour. I've not used old flour. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's like technically to cover the bases, they give you those instructions. But um, if it's a strong culture, it's my belief that it can withstand <laughs> the wild organisms that are on the flour. So hopefully that was helpful, Beverly. And what fascinating information from your friend at Oregon State and the fact that he baked all those loaves. It was incredible. I, I, I was Let's not over and above. <laughs> this is how you answer all your questions. And they were questions that were, you know, were simply um, really important uh, yeah. to me because people ask me questions and I don't I don't want to give answers since, since you know I haven't done any research in my life and I've only been baking for a short time I, I don't want to provide answers that are just what I'd like to mm -hmm. hear coming you know mm -hmm. and so uh, this has been my privilege to meet such people and I have to say that the this whole community of, of, of I'm going to say the grain community has been unbelievably receptive to what we're doing and supportive of, 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 of our objective to see, a, and we say it, to see a, a grain mill uh, in every kitchen in 20 years from now. Yeah. Well, you're doing a wonderful service because we didn't have the option of the mock mill uh, even up till recently. So you're making the trade-off between, okay, only flour or it's too hot or it's too expensive, you know, but now we have inexpensive versatility, fine flour, cool to the touch. I just think, wow, this is what we've been waiting for for so long. So I really hope everybody, I mean, take action if you can or put it on the back burner and add it to your Christmas list. But the mock mill is really a wonderful, wonderful mill that I don't think you will I don't think anyone will regret. And the information is on the screen, tradcookschool.com slash mock mill, which will give you a lot more information about it. Um, to claim the extra bonus from me, you go to tradcookschool.com slash mill bonus. After you make your purchase, you'll need your order number, receipt number to enter that into the claim form. Um, and what's not on the screen is askwardy.tv. We're doing a whole series on home grain milling, the basics, doing it with gluten-free, specialty, making adjustments in your recipes. So be sure to check that out. That's the whole month of November. Paul, do you have anything else to add before we close? Not, not except to say that I'm, I'm really uh, grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today, Ordi. I'm, I'm following and also learning from, from uh, your podcast. I think... Um, this is the great thing, too, that we learn from each other. Absolutely. And I thank everybody who tuned in for their attention and all those who will uh, listen to the podcast later on. Yes. Well, thank you to you, Paul, for sharing your passion 
and your wisdom and your knowledge with us. It's been a pleasure to hear about you and your wife and your work with Wolfgang Mock. And thank you to everyone who has been here, either coming and going or here the whole time. We hope that you found this a blessing. It was really fun to do. And I just thank you so much, Paul. It's been a real pleasure, Hardy. Uh, Hardy. Thank you. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.